as uh, Tim was saying, I am a, a scientist at NCAR and I work a lot in winter weather. And I'm going to be sharing you some work that I've been doing related to uh, ground de-icing. Let's see if I can get this to work. Here we go. Okay. So the question that I want to try to answer today and that I've been trying to answer in my research is why is it important to measure snow? So if you look at the mountains, you all of you, I think, live in Colorado. We know about uh, snow and the importance of snow for going skiing or uh, sledding or having fun outside. And we know that snow in the mountains is important to agriculture because it melts and, and comes down to the plains and, and farmers use it to water their crops. So that's all, all very important. But another important reason to measure snow is when we travel. And when we travel on commercial airplanes, on, on regular airplanes like United Airlines, um, when it's snowing like it is right now on the east coast of the United States, uh, you have to be very careful when you take off because uh, snow will will have a significant impact on the performance of an aircraft like a 757 or you know big commercial airplane. Before I get into this a little bit more, I just wanted to mention that uh, we do a lot of collaborative research at NCAR and uh, I've listed some of my collaborators. Some of them are not from NCAR, some of them are from NOAA. These guys are from uh, Southeast United States, NOAA. And I also work with some folks from uh, Italy, Matteo Colli is from Italy and Julie Terrio is from Canada. So we have a very international group of scientists working on snow. It snows everywhere, everywhere around the world. So let's go to the next slide. And this is what happens when it's snowing out or there's snow on a wing and you have to take off and go someplace. Um, it's not safe for an aircraft to take off with uh, snow on its wing because it impacts the, uh, the lift and the drag on the aircraft. So as a result, every airline has to get de-iced. Now, what do I mean by de-iced? De-iced means that you have to remove the snow and ice from a wing before it can take off. And the way they do it now, nowadays, is they use something called de-icing fluids. And de-icing fluids uh, are different colors, like there's a pink one on the right, and then there's a green one. And the pink one is, to, is mostly used to remove the ice, and the green one is used to protect against um, ice forming again. So it's sort of like the antifreeze in your car, uh, if you're familiar with that at all. So it, it, in fact, the icing fluids are typically some kind of uh, antifreeze uh, fluid. So when the snow falls into it, it melts. And that's essentially how the antifreeze works in your car. It doesn't freeze at normal at uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And Roy, I had a question about those, the colors. It's a little hard to tell the pink and the green in this photo, but if you were in that plane looking out the window and it was daytime, might you be able to see the color? Yeah, you can see you can see the colors. Uh, what they typically do is is they they first remove the ice with the pink one. They call that type one fluid, and that's just a hot fluid. It, they they heat it to about a hundred degrees Celsius, and, and they're boiling, and they they get rid of all the ice and snow, and then they put on the green fluid, which is usually called a type four fluid, but it's called anti icing fluid. So it's anti snow formation. So that's a thicker fluid that uh, absorbs the snow and causes it to melt. So it's like water. And then when the aircraft takes off, the type four fluid becomes like water. It's, it's like molasses when it gets on, goes on the plane. And then it, it has a special property that once, once it feels wind shear over the top of it, it turns into a fluid that flows off. So that's why there's two different fluids. Type one is more like water, just hot water, but with the icing fluid in and type four is the thick like molasses, but has special property that it turns into water when the plane takes off so that it runs off because you don't want that fluid on the plane 
when you're flying because that'll oh. cause a lot of trouble in controlling the aircraft. I didn't know that. <laughs> so uh, I learned a lot of this when I got into this field. So normally I, I do winter weather research, but uh, I work in the research applications laboratory. So the the airline industry came to us and said, hey, we need help with weather related to aircraft icing and aircraft de-icing. So this is the part of the work that is, has involved me with aircraft de-icing. So I got to meet some of the United Airlines guys who are, there's a guy sitting in each of, each of those little uh, ye uh, yellow cabins. And I met some of those guys and they, they told me, they taught me how they do de-icing and I taught them a little bit about winter weather. So it was, uh, great uh, collaboration and interaction. So I'm gonna get a little, little scientific on you here. Um, I'm going to talk about how the icing fluids are tested. So there's a couple of terminologies I wanted to mention to you. One is endurance time. That is the time a particular de-icing fluid, say type one, which is that yellow fluid or pink fluid, sorry, and uh, type four last before they they don't absorb the snow anymore. So remember, these are these are uh, essentially uh, diluted uh, diluted fluids that uh, anti-icing fluids like like the antifreeze in your car. And when you put snow into it, it dilutes it. And then once it gets diluted enough, it it runs off and it. Could, could cause the fluid to freeze. So that's what they call the endurance time or the failure time. How long will a particular fluid last? So if I spray it on the aircraft, it only lasts, the, the pink fluid lasts only 10 minutes. So you have to take off within 10 minutes. So a pilot has to know that information. Well, how does he know that? Well, let's see if I can get my, oh, there's, there's my slide movement. Um, how does he know that? Well, in the, in the laboratory, we actually test these fluids and we actually uh, calculate the precipitation rate or the snowfall rate. And this unit here is grams per decimeter square. This is, tells you how much water is in the snow. And endurance time is the amount of time that a particular de-icing fluid will last. This happens to be a type four uh, oct uh, octagon fluid is made by a company named Octagon. So how, how does the pilot know, know the precipitation rate and the endurance time? Well, what they do, I'm trying to get my, there we go. What they do is they determine when there's light and very light precipitation rate. So zero to 10 is, is uh, very light. This unit converts to uh, millimeters per hour if you divide it by 10. So 10 divided by 10 is one. So this is one millimeter an hour. So very light snow is, is here. Moderate snow is over here. So if you have a type of fluid and, and you have moderate snow, then you might say, well, maybe I have uh, 40 minutes. Or if you want to be conservative, you can go up here and say, maybe I have 110 minutes. But usually you're conservative and say, well, you probably have 40 minutes. So the aircraft has to take off in 40 minutes. If you have heavy snow, then you, you're greater than 2.5 or 25 grams per decimeter square per hour. So the pilots actually have tables. This is a table that a pilot will use to when he's, he's operating under aircraft the icing conditions. And what was shown here are numbers. These numbers are the time that he has until that fluid fails. So let's say that, and over here is the outside air temperature. So he goes and calculates or determines what the outside air temperature, let's say it was minus three or 27 degrees Fahrenheit. And he goes over here and he says, okay, I'm in snow conditions and I'm in light snow. And if I'm in light snow, I have eight to 14 minutes of time before I need to go get re-de-iced. So basically it tells him how much time he has before he has to take off. And if the fluid, if he goes past that 14 minutes and he, he's in light snow, then he needs to get go back and get re-de-iced. 
So it's very important that he knows that for safety reasons. And these columns have been devised so that the pilots will know that. Well, how does the pilot know it's light, moderate, or heavy snow? Well, what, the, what he does is he listens to uh, a, a radio frequency from the National Weather Service. And the National Weather Service determines light, moderate, heavy snow by visibility. So that's very different than the amount of water in the snow. And this is the research part that I got involved with. And my question was, well, does visibility work to calculate the amount of water in the snow? So if you look here, I have for light snow, if the visibility in snow is greater than half a mile, then it's light. If it's between half a mile and a quarter of a mile, it's moderate and greater than a quarter mile, it's heavy. So does that correspond to, uh, to uh, the, the amount of water and snow? And that's the question I asked. Um, and that got me into the scientific questions of looking at real snow. And so this is something I learned in school. Uh, these are different snow crystal types. These are stellars or dendritic crystals as you get more branches. You can look on your, when it's snowing outside you can look on your sleeve when the snow lands and see what kind of crystal you have. This is stellar or dendritic crystal. The one on the right is the sort of a stellar with heavy rhyming. Rhyming means that the cloud droplets in the cloud have uh, frozen onto the crystal. So you can see that it's still six-sided, but it, it, it's, it tended to disappear. And every snowflake is different, as you've heard. Uh, these are grapple uh, or snow pellets. These are very heavily rhymed crystals. So once this guy gets a lot of cloud frozen cloud droplets, it starts looking like, like this. Sometimes the crystals look like needles. So getting back to the science of the, of the uh, whole problem, the question I asked, or the question I asked myself was, is the visibility through a dendritic crystal or snow pellet the same as through needles or, or, these, or these other crystals? And so I decided to do some research on that. And this is a, a plot of, of some of my data. All the little dots are not, are not uh, some of them are real, some of them are, no, are bad graphics, but a lot of these dots are actual data points that I collected at a field site we have in south of Boulder, the Anchor field site. And these lines are theories. And so what I plotted here is the snowfall rate that I measured with an instrument versus visibility that I measured with an instrument and also measured it with my eye. We had a, a line of telephone poles that we would look at. So let's say the, uh, I wanna estimate uh, a snowfall rate of 1.7 millimeters per hour. And I wanna use visibility. So what would it be if I use visibility? Well, visibility would say there's only one point here that is 1.7 millimeters per hour in terms of visibility. But in reality, if my visibility was say between light and moderate, my, my actual snowfall rate could vary between 0.1 millimeters per hour to over 10 millimeters per hour. And the dangerous part is that my, my estimate by visibility could, would be, could be wrong and it could be wrong on this side of the curve, which means that my light to moderate snow could actually be more like moderate to heavy. And remember I told you about snow pellets? Well, that's what, that's what happens. These snow pellets are very uh, small and dense. And so you can see right through them, through, through the air when they're snowing with the snow pellets, whereas the dendritic snow tends to be blocked more. So it turns out that visibility is not a good way to, to measure snow. So we have to measure it with an instrument. And the other thing that I uh, discovered and thought about was one day I was at LaGuardia Airport in New York City and I uh, landed at 3 p.m. and it was snowing. And I looked outside and what I found out was when the, it became dark, it looked like the snow disappeared. And I thought, well, it was just snowing, you know, five minutes ago. 
I went outside and it was still snowing. And that little episode made me think about nighttime versus daytime visibility. And we did some more calculations and some theory. And what we found is that the nighttime visibility is a factor of two larger than daytime visibility. So that means I could go from, uh, from light snow or, or from heavy snow in the daytime. And just because it became dark, it would suddenly become moderate snow by visibility. And that was not, that's not a good thing. So based on all that research, we came up with a way to improve the estimation of the, uh, the intensity of snowfall rate. And we give, we give that information to pilots. Well, in fact, one of the, uh, the organizations we're working with is UPS in Louisville, Kentucky, which is distributing the vaccine. So what we gave them was, was this kind of product where we actually uh, have the liquid water equivalent of snowfall instead of visibility. And we indicate every minute, whether it's light snow, moderate snow, or heavy snow. So they can use that to determine how long they have for their de-icing fluids. And that's today, um, I'm hoping that they're using it and hopefully getting the vaccine out on time. So- right. That was um, that was amazing. I, I hate to interrupt. We do, so I don't want to. I want to make sure we don't run out of time. And I I think that was probably the quickest summary of of a question to actual delivery of a product and application that I, I think I've ever seen. That was amazing. I I would I'll let you know that there were some great questions about the um, the machine that actually sprays the planes. So that's probably going on in K Kentucky right now. That's right? right. Yes, because they do. Are they having snow? I think they are having snow on the East Coast. They, they had right. snow. I think the storm has moved up towards Maine now in Boston. So I think they're past it. But but I'm done. That's that's my oh, last slide. So perfect time. Excellent. And did you have any questions that you would like to pose to our our audience? Uh, Maybe to, to get them to think about the, the you know, how to, to look at it, because you, you've described, the, you know, very well. well what next next time it's snowing outside, look at the visibility and, and, and try to estimate whether it's light, moderate, heavy snow. And take a look at, put your sleeve out and, and look at the snow crystal types and see if you can correlate the type of, of snow crystals and visibility. And uh, I mean, we did have, we had a lots of questions about the actual process of spraying the trucks. Would, would it be okay if we went back to that slide? And yeah. we'll, we'll let oh, the, sure. yeah. any we other questions good. come into the chat while we're looking at that picture again. They said it looks sort of like a, uh, an excavator. Somebody said it looks sort of like an excavator. <laughs> and I was describing it's, it's like a booth that floats on uh, up in the air and the what's happening is that's literally like a fire hose spraying those yeah. fluids and so there's a hose that attaches to this so this is a hose and you can't see the actually you can see the sort of the truck here this 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 uh column is attached to this truck and in this truck they have a, a reservoir of the icing fluid so he, this guy it, pushes a knot, pushes a, a valve or or a, um, it has like a trigger switch and that controls the speed of which at which the the icing fluid comes out of the nozzle I think this is all pink pink uh, fluid because you can see pink on the ground here as well so this is type one so they're just getting rid of all the snow on the top of the the aircraft excellent yeah. we, we just had a question come in do you always get to work with very practical real life applications like this? Do I always get to work on this kind of stuff? Yeah, practical. Well, um, when I started this job, uh, I had no idea what I was gonna get into. What, with, what my first part of the job was to try to um, bring weather information to the aircraft de-icing community. So the first thing I did is had them look at the, uh, the weather radar, which you guys probably look at every day when it's snowing. 
at least I do. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't assume. <laughs> but uh, the what the weather radar, you know, when you watch the the uh, the news, the weather on the news on the nightly news, they always show the the weather radar, and um, that was something when I started this in the nineties. The the weather radar wasn't uh, as common, so the first thing we did when I got started was give them the weather radar information. But what I realized, I would, and I was trying to convert the radar the radar data to snowfall rate. Well, I realized that's not simple to do because snow is the same problem, has, has many different crystal types. And so the radar return is different for every snow crystal type. Oh so uh, once I figured that out, then I thought, well, what about visibility in snow? And so every one thing led to another. So I didn't start out thinking about this in this way, but, uh, but thinking of their problem and what they needed, the information they needed, I could then relate my weather knowledge to their applied problem. So, so you think um, some of our viewers could possibly try this at home next time it's snowing and, and guess how far uh, a plane could see or a pilot could see? Um, I think you could uh, sit at home and look look outside and and see how far you can see. You'd have to, um, you know, get you know know how far a certain tree is or some object that you can see, and uh, and try to correlate that with the the visibility. I mean, I mean, when it's snowing heavily, it gets really you know you can't see very far. The question is is really when you get to a moderate snow that's when it gets tricky because you can sort of see and you can sort of operate in moderate snow, but sometimes you can get fooled by visibility. So that's why it's much better to actually measure the rate with a, a, a snow gauge or some instrument. Excellent. And everyone who joins us has to tell us kind of what is the, what's the, your favorite part of your job? My favorite part of the job is that nobody tells me what to do. I can do whatever I want <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, figure something like this out. So you ask me, do it, we all get to do this? Well, I get to do what I think is the right thing to do. And this is what I thought was the right thing to do. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's the great. Creative, the creative part of my job that I like the best because this, this whole topic uh, didn't exist until I, I started working on it. So. Yeah, do you have any, I do you have any was, advice that's for that's young the people? Part, that's the best part of my job. No, I don't have a boss. I there just you don't. go. <laughs> so, do you have any advice for the, the young people with us today on if they want to be a scientist or how to think more like a scientist? Well, if you, if you uh, enjoy a math and science, uh, that, that's a good base for starting to be a scientist. But I think, uh, you know, you have to, uh, think out of the box a little bit and be creative and question assumptions. So when, when I got into this particular job, um, I questioned the assumption that the uh, light, moderate, heavy snow by visibility could be a good way for an airline to measure the light, moderate, heavy intensity of snow based on the amount of water in the snow. That was basically questioning uh, an assumption that had been true for 25, 30 years. That's how they wow. had been doing operations. And the, the airlines, um, the FAA was about to pass a rule that required air, air uh, required pilots to use snowfall intensity estimated by visibility. That was the year I, after I got, you know, the year I got started and I stopped that, that, that the rulemaking. And, the, oh. the, and instead they have now now the rules are that you need to take into account day and night and, and you need to think about the liquid water equivalent of the snowfall rate in order to estimate the amount of time that a fluid has. So- Excellent. Roy, we important. do have a question. Is it okay if, I, if uh, someone has their hand up? Is it okay if we let them uh, ask yeah, their question? Good. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Kelly Davidson, yes, you can unmute and ask if you'd like. Uh, what is the machine called that sprays the plane? What is it called? Uh, yes, what is it called? They, 
they have different names, but they're usually called the icing trucks. And usually they're a truck that has, uh, uh, they fill it up with the icing fluid, which is typically antifreeze. And they will drive it to the aircraft and they usually have a de-icing pad. Like if you ever fl fly with United in the wintertime, they have a particular location where they where they park the aircraft and then they say, okay, the pilot will get online and say, oh, I need to de-ice the aircraft because there's snow on the wing. So he'll stop. And most of the time they turn off the engines and then they'll, they'll have to wait for 10, 15 minutes while these the icing trucks drive to the aircraft and spray, spray it and remove all the snow and ice. Does that answer your question? Yes, but also right now I'm sort of imagining a gas truck with an arm on it with sort of a booth. Right, it kind of looks like a gas. It looks like a gas truck, but instead of gas, they put in uh, antifreeze, the uh, icing fluid. Now, the icing fluid isn't just antifreeze like it's in your car. It, they have special, special additives that they put in the icing fluid, so it's different. So you have to buy it from a particular company. There's about five or six different companies in the world that sell the icing fluids. So every airline will 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 either do their own de-icing or, or hire somebody to do their, their de-icing. And that means at the beginning of the winter, they have to order fluid and store it in a tank someplace and then put it in this truck when it's starting to snow. So it's really important for an airline to know when it's gonna snow because they have to get ready to do all this de-icing work. So that's another reason why it's important to give them warning about snow. Thank you for answering my question. That did a lot for me. Oh, <laughs> that, that is excellent. And you know, unfortunately, we we are right at time, a little bit over actually. And we are just so everybody knows. Well, we're going to thank Roy here in just a second, but we will be doing this again after the holidays. We're going to take a break, and then on January twenty first, we'll start again. And there will be a. Uh, I just put the link to our website in the chat. So you might have to copy that. I'm not sure it's live. You might have to copy it and paste it. But uh, yeah, if we could, everybody uh, in the chat, uh, if you'd like to say thanks, go ahead and put that in the chat window. And uh, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to paste the URL for our young people, uh, grades five to 12, to head over to, if you would, to, um, Give us a little feedback, and I'm not sure that paid correctly. I'll try that one more time. But yes, Roy, we got a thank you from our young visitors there, and I'd like a thanks as well. And um, if you have any questions, uh, continuations, please do find our contact our email address in there. There you go. You can shoot me a question. I'll get it over to Roy. And um, thank you all for joining us. Well, thank you for, for listening and hope you uh, learned a little bit about the, the icing and winter weather and snow. Fantastic. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye now. Goodbye. Um.